Islam has one a comprehensive and unchanged scripture. It is exactly the same, word to word, letter to letter. And this is from just one version. Those are all the variations. There's typically a hundred to a hundred and fifty variations. To say that there's only one Quran isn't uh, isn't true. We can see that there are there are multiple copies. <laughs>
you know, turn to page 1026. You may be in Galatians. Someone else could be in Chronicles. They'd be like, what are you talking about? But in terms of the Quran that they have today, most Muslims would say that it's just one Quran. Is that right? Yeah, totally. And the the view is that this is a standard text and the um, unchanged. Um, so when they talk about it, they can refer to it in, in these ways, thinking that there's um, there's going to be no discussion, no, no debate about uh, what the content of the Quran is. Well, I think it's great for us to kind of bring out that content. But I, I think before we even do that, I'd love to go over somewhat of the Muslim, the Islamic narrative concerning how they came by the transmission of the Quran, especially if you're talking about there's only one book, there's no changes, there's no other uh, Quran and so forth. I would love for maybe our listeners to understand maybe what the Islamic narrative, and then we could probably go into historical and not it's problematic, even their own narrative. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So the standard view is that um, Muhammad was the sole recipient of the Quran. So the revelations came to him uh, through the prophet, uh, through the angel Gabriel, and he uh, was the recipient of them. He, maintain them and then he would recite them to other people and these people would either memorize them or sometimes they would write bits of them down and so when muhammad died in 632 according to the islamic uh, timetable the the content of the quran was memorized by many people and they had some written records and they tried to put those together so when um, uh, uh, there was an important battle called the battle of yamana where many of the muslims were killed, including those who had memorized the Quran. They're called Hufaz, uh, which is memorizers. And so they decided they needed to write down some of the, um, get down a proper written record. And there was one that was put together um, and that was um, uh, held, uh, placed uh, with with one of um, Muhammad's wives, um, Hafsa, and she had this copy. This was in the, uh, the time of the first Caliph uh, Abu Bakr. But as time went on, people also had different versions. And uh, so Muhammad talked about some very important reciters, so guys like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Abu Musa. And he said, if you want to learn the Quran, learn from these guys. And these guys were reciting the Quran, but that they would recite it in different ways and they had different understandings of what the Quran would be. And this came to a head uh, at the time when the Muslims, during the time of Uthman, the third caliph, and the Muslims were invading um, Armenia. And uh, the troops got there and they said, um, the people who follow Abdullah ibn Masud's recitation go over to that side of the, of the mosque, the meeting place, and those who follow Abu Musa's go to the other side. And so they were both, both groups were reciting the Quran together, but they were different versions. And there was a man there named uh, Hudayfa, and he said, this is no good. We can't have different versions of the Quran going around. We need to have only one version. So he goes back to the caliph and he says, you need to stop this. We can't differ about the book the same as, he said, the, the same as the Christians and the Jews differ about their book. And so um, Uthman said, all right, we will uh, authorize just one Quran version. And he gets a one man or a committee of four people, including Zaid bin Thabit, who was the, the man who collected the first version. And he said, I want you four to agree on a copy of on a version of the Quran. And so they collected all of the different um, written versions that they had. And they brought in all the, the people and they asked people, if you remember a verse of the Quran, come and tell us. And each verse needed to have two people saying, yes, I remember hearing Muhammad recite that. And so they put together one version, which is called now the Uthmanic recension or um, revision. And then Uthman ordered that all of the other copies be burnt. And this one, there was made um, uh, multiple copies of it. And then this became the standard kind of Quran, um, according to the Muslim view. And that has never changed uh, throughout um 1400 years so that would be considered the islamic narrative concerning the transmission of the quran from muhammad to zayd ibn tabit right um and then you you had the caliphs right the rightly divided caliphs and so forth so so this is 
the Islamic narrative. Now, there was a huge controversy over the last year because of a Muslim apologist by the name of Muhammad Hijab, and he had Dr. Sheikh Yasser Qadi, who's from America. He, he was studied in at Yale University, and there was. I mean, they had to take everything down from the internet after their interview, and there was a lot of talk, and, and I, I think maybe you're going to have to define some terms for our audience because they're probably not going to be familiar with them, but I, I guess to kind of let you leapfrog from here, basically, he was asking about, wait a second, there's multiple Qurans, people have seen them, in fact, I believe it was Jay, Jay Smith uh, who had shown at Speaker's Corner in London to Muhammad Hijab that, hey, I got multiple Qurans here. So what's going on here? And basically, Dr. Sheikh Yasser Qadi said, well, after a lot of kind of squirreling around, he basically said there's holes in the Islamic narrative concerning the transmission of the Quran. So maybe if you can, I'd love for you to kind of explain to our audience what that's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the, the the problem was that when um, Muhammad died, the, uh, and when this version of Uthman's version was put together, they um, the the earliest version of the Quran had no dots in it um, and no vowel pointings. And these are very important in the in the Quran. Uh, there's uh, I think only seven letters out of the uh, the twenty eight which have. Um, uh, which are uh, lacking dots and therefore are unambiguous with all of the other ones that you need to add dots. It would actually help if I put a, a slide up. Would that, is that possible? Can I share that with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll see if I can do that. Now. Yeah. Especially considering I, I got to know who you are through <laughs> Jay Smith using Dr. J Smith using some of your slides. So yeah, I'd love <laughs> to put one up and, yeah. and help us uh, okay. get to know this a little bit better. This, this sounds great. And I, and I, and guys, we're, if you're listening right now, we are with Dr. Bernie Power, and he's an expert on, on all things Islam, and he does just a wonderful job. And if you guys want to check him out, you can go to YouTube and to his channel, just type in Bernie Power. You can't miss him. He's on there, and he's got some wonderful videos, and he's going in right now on the transmission of the Islamic text, and not only the Islamic version and narrative of how we have the Quran today, but also what the historical uh, view is as well. Yeah, you can see from that slide there, by 650 AD, so this is only 20 years after Muhammad died, the, there were different versions of the Quran that were circulating. And um, uh, so <clears throat> Muhammad said to his people, when you want to learn the Quran, learn from these people. And he gave a couple of names. And these are some of the names. So you've got uh, Ubay ibn Kab who had a version up in Damascus uh, with 115 chapters, Abdullah ibn Masood in Kufa with 111, Abu Musa al-Ashri in Basra with 116, and Zaid bin Thabit in Medina with 114 chapters. And so they couldn't even agree which chapters would go in there. Abdullah ibn Masood, for example, said, uh, the first chapter, um, Surah Al-Fatiha, and the last two, Surahs 113 and 114, don't belong in the Quran. They're Muhammad's prayers. They, they were never revealed to him by Allah. Others added in other chapters or combined them together. So they had variant versions of the, the numbers of chapters that were there. And then, um, past him. Um, and then Muslims say, yes, but the Quran, when it came to Muhammad, he recited it to a whole variety of people. And you can see in this second column here, um, so people like Umar and Zaid bin Thabit and Ibn, Ibn Masood and Uthman. And then they recited it to other people who then recited it to other people. So you can see the second last column. Um, and these are called the Qira'at the recitals, uh, recitals uh, um, and then the riwayat, uh, the versions that are there on the far right-hand side. Now, we do, we do not have a copy of the Quran. The earliest versions of the Quran had no dots in it. Here's the Arabic alphabet, and you can see how important the dots are because they help us identify the different letters. And when we take out the letters, take out the dots we're not sure what letters they are they could be any kind of different different letters so without the um without the dots there's only seven unambiguous letters in the quran um and that makes it difficult so when you put a word together like here's a a three-letter word and you put the dots on them you can put the dots in different places and then you come up with 
a whole lot of different words and you can see some of the difference uh, differences of the words that there it could mean he repents or she destroyed um, he brooded or a house or fixed the the version the word could mean anything and so people actually had to know what the text said before they could um, uh, before they could recite the text and they had to be able to put it to they had to uh, be able to put it together in their their own mind before they could recite what the text was um, and people didn't always get that right and we'll see here so going back to this one the uh, on the on the far right the list there of all the riwayat is um, different versions of the Quran where they've got the dots put in different places now I'll show you what this means um, because I've got uh, an example here. So what this means is that when you uh, take out a copy of the Quran, then you can find and you compare that with different versions. And I've got my list here of uh, different different Qurans. Um, I've got a list of twenty-seven of them here. <laughs> um, oh, wow! You uh, you can open up the Quran and you can have a look at uh, how the different the different versions vary. And I've done this with a whole group of. Uh, um, uh, Arabic speaking friends and I've done some myself so we would look at the, um, the the different letters and compare that with another text which has got that and we can see the variations now I'm only looking at consonantal variations here and this is from just one version those are all the variations there's typically a hundred to a hundred and fifty variations between any two copies of the Quran um, so to say that there's only one Quran isn't uh, isn't true um, because we know that there we can see that there are there are multiple copies. So there's my my collection of uh, different versions of the Quran. Every single one of them is different. Um, to wow. say that there's only one Quran is is not true, um, and in fact it's never been true. Um, and by the uh, way, these uh, these sorry, are I easy. To ask a quick question, because yeah, sure, yeah. I think maybe from a Western mindset, from from us, maybe it's not really a big deal. Who you know, so what? You know, we have the Holman Study Bible, we have the NASB, we you know, and and so forth, and and we see all this. But for a Muslim, when they see those twenty seven Qurans, and you're saying there's absolutely differences in them, why is this such a big deal for a Muslim? Where as a Christian, that seemingly isn't that big of a deal. Okay, yeah, so. Two things that are important to recognize. One is when uh, Muslims talk about the Bible being changed, they're often talking about English translations. And so they'll say, well, your King James Version is different from your, uh, you know, NIV. Therefore, your Bible has been changed. We'll say, well, actually, those are um, translations. You need to go back to the original text. And the problem for Muslims is this is the original text. So it's the Arabic text. It's not as though it's an Urdu version or an English uh, translation, but the actual Arabic text. And the claim from Muslims is that Muhammad received these words in Arabic from Gabriel, and this is exactly what Muhammad passed on. But because there's so much variation, then it raises questions about what was actually what were the actual words that Muhammad passed on uh, during uh, during that time, or whether any of them got it right because. Um, the, we saw earlier that the four um, early reciters all differed on the number of chapters. They couldn't agree on that. So it was a real problem. Now, I just wanted to ask this as well, because you showed what the Islamic narrative was about the Uthmanic text. And I, are there any manuscripts from that era? Are there any Uthmanic manuscripts? Well, we don't have anything from that, that particular area. Some Muslims would claim that they do, um, and they'll say, uh, yeah, we've, um, uh, you know, the one that's, for example, in, uh, in Tashkent or maybe the one in, um, uh, uh, in Istanbul, uh, sorry, um, the Topkapi um, version. But when they've been dated, they haven't been shown to be um, from that period. They're, they're later versions. So we don't have one. We do have a whole series of early manuscripts and of um, people, uh, you know, of uh, variations, a bit like with the Bible. We've got these early manuscripts, you know, you've got uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and, and others. So we have the equivalent in um uh, in in the Quran, but again, you know, the problem is none of those early manuscripts have um, 
uh, have the dots in them so you can come out with any one of these different versions that we have come drawing from some of those manuscripts wow that i think that's pretty incredible so when it comes to the differences because i i'll tell you this i was out in texas and i shared I was sharing the gospel on the streets there, and we were talking with a Muslim family, and I brought out exactly what we're talking about here, at least 27 different Qurans um, out there right now as we speak, not translations in English, right? There's, what, 106, I believe, somewhere around there, English translations of the Quran. But when it comes to the, the Quran, these are Arabic Qurans, you know, with the names like Warsh, right, and and Hafs, and so forth, and these are versions of the Quran being read in places like uh, in Africa and so forth that are different than what they're reading. But are there any differences? Because I know, like Dr. Shabir Ali, who's a very famous, probably the most famous Muslim apologist uh, in this era, and you know, he would say, you know, well, there's no doctrinal differences. But I mean, is that really a good apologetic for them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, the the problem is that the claim was there has never been a uh, any change at all. Um, I'll just give you a, a couple of quotes. This is one here. Yeah, okay, yeah. He says, so well has been uh, preserved both in uh, the Arabic text we have today is identical to the text that was revealed to the prophet. Not even a single letter has yielded to corruption during the passage of the centuries. And of course, Yusuf Ali is an important translator of the um, uh, of the Quran. His version was the one that was uh, the standard one. Another one, um, El Hajj Ajijola. He says. It's so fully preserved and not a jot or tittle has been left out, quoting uh -huh. the words of Jesus. Um, so for Muslims, I would say, yeah, the issue is we, we haven't got any any variation at all. As Christians, we've always accepted that there's um, multiple manuscripts and we've got a wealth of manuscripts and we recognise that the, the process is not perfect and you have some uh, transmission variations. But Muslims have been unwilling to even countenance that but now it's being forced upon them and so um you know shabir ali is now coming out with these statements well okay so it doesn't really matter um here he is here talking about that um that there are some variations because it doesn't affect our doctrine um, but that's not the claim that's been made over the centuries Sounds like a Christian uh, apologetic exactly <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> that, that, that we would use I'm sure it's been used on him before And one of the things I, I find that's very interesting on this topic, because even when it comes to the Islamic narrative that you went over about this Umanic text, taking Hafsa, one of uh, one of Muhammad's wives and a caliph's daughter and so forth. And I believe she she had hid this manuscript under her bed. Is that right? For that's like right, a yeah. decade, I, I think is, is somewhat of the narrative that, that went out. And when we talk about specifically the scriptures, and getting back the scriptures and understanding that we believe that in the original autographs and exactly what they said is we know that the corruption of the text would be so difficult because of the vast amount of manuscripts that are all over. So if somebody was, you know, messing with the text, who cares? Because the guy down the street's not and the guy way away from you is not. And when we combine it, we can see very clearly what the author who is God himself intended. But when you now have, even in their own narrative, when you now have to put all of your faith that Uthman got it right in, in this text, I, I think that really puts them in such a disadvantage already. And that's for their best narrative. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I, I think this is really, really important. And, and so when it comes to those doctrinal differences, not, not, are, are there doctrinal differences as well or things that would change from uh, the consonant text? I'll, I'll give you one example there. Let me see if I can pull this one up straight away. Um, okay, one that affects the... Um, by the way, so I've, we've gone through the text and we've just given a list of all of the differences just to give you a bit of an idea of... Um, how many there are okay um so this is just between the huffs and the wash so the two most common ones uh, yeah that you mentioned the huffs would be they call this the 1926 the cairo text also called the standard text and that's the one that's the saudis by the way are pushing they're um printing millions of these and trying to uh, uh 
put them around the world. The other main version would be the Warsh version, and in North Africa, that would be the standard kind of one. Um, but if you compare the two, there's over 120 consonantal or long vowel or symbol, symbol differences which affect the meanings of words. So, you know, like in English, um, for example, America, you spell center, C-E-N-T-E-R, and we sell it C-E-N-T-R-E. -E. This isn't that. These are different ones. Um, so you've changed the word from C-E-N-T-R-E -E to C-O-N-T-R-O-L. You know, you've changed the meaning of the word. It's, it's got a different, a different meaning. Um, I'll give you one which is important in terms of the, um, uh, let's see. Mm, proclamation. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've got it highlighted. A poor person. Okay, here's one in. Um, uh, you can see the highlighted one at the top of uh, their number one, uh, verse two hundred and eighty-four. And the Arabic word there says uh, maskinen, the um, uh, a, a poor person. And the Hafs version, the Hafs, uh, sorry, the Hafs says maskinen, and the Arabic says uh, masakin. And so it's the um, question of what happens if you are not able to fast during Ramadan. Who do? What do you do? And he said, feed a poor person or feed poor people. And so do you just feed one person or do you feed multiple people? And because it's very important in terms of fulfilling the law that you do the right things. And people were unclear about that. And you need to then go to the Hadith in order to find out uh, how many poor people, whether it's just one or multiple um, and uh, what, the, what the situation is there. Oh, I, I, you know, and we're, we're talking with Dr. Bernie Power from Melbourne School of Theology. Just uh, wonderful to, to see this and understand these narratives and understand, you know, what we can do to talk, talk with Muslims on the streets and, and share with them about this because it does seem like they have built themselves up. They believe the Quran is eternal. It's sitting in heaven right now and so forth. And it, it, it's great to kind of be able to point these things out that Dr. Bernie Power is sharing with us. And you know, we're so blessed to, to hear from him right now on these things. And it's really, really important when we talk about it. And as he's talking about these doctrinal differences, especially because we're talking about Islam, where he's talking about a work that they're supposed to do during Ramadan. One of the five pillars, you have to practice Ramadan. It is a works-based religion in terms of their salvation. And so if you are unable to know what you're supposed to practice in a works-based religion, that seems like kind of a problem. Is that right, Dr. Power? Yeah, and um, <clears throat> very much for Muslims, they will believe their, yeah, their eternal salvation will depend on this. So they, they really want to know what these things are, and they really have to know. It's, it's not a sense of whether it's um, or, you know, uh, optional or not. They, they need to do that. Um, so that that's why you know they'll say, well, yeah, we need to we need to work this out. And so the legal scholars over the centuries have put together a whole lot of things around this, taking into account the fact that these there were variant texts. By the way, scholars over the centuries haven't denied these things. They've known known these uh, around and they've responded to them. It's only in probably the last century, maybe since the. Um, the standardized, standardized version came out of Cairo that they decided that there was only one version. This is a, a, a relatively new doctrine. By the way, when uh, the um, at Cairo they decided that the there was only going to be this one Arabic version, the Hus version, they collected all the other ones and they dumped them in the Nile River. So um, the uh, Qurans were, un, were burnt in the time of Uthman and drowned in the time of uh, uh, of the um, yeah the Cairo recension that came out. Well, you know, I, I think that is very, very interesting to hear of these specific two instances where you have a, let's standardize the text, let's make sure no one else, there's no nothing else coming in. And I guess more inquisitively, I, I got to know, wh why on earth, why in, in Cairo did they choose this text over any of the others? 
Mm, yeah. So the, the the reason seems to be, of course, at that time, the major Muslim empire was the uh, the Ottoman Empire, and uh, they particularly liked the Hafsa version. Uh, that was the one which was being used by uh, many government officials and scholars and whatever. And Egypt, of course, had been part of that. And so they had a kind of a uh, an affection for it. And they decided that that's the one that they would stick with. It was the one which was mo most commonly available. Um, so they thought we'll, we'll, we'll go with that one. I guess a, a nice popularity contest uh, there yes, yes, yes. <laughs> of transmission. That's really interesting. And so I, I guess you've probably been engaging somewhat, not only with, I know you've debated, uh, I believe it's Adnan Rashid. Um, mm -hmm. You've debated him publicly. You've probably looked at some material from Dr. Sheikh Yasser Takadi, uh, Dr. Shabir Ali. And so when it comes to how they deal with this multiple versions, maybe you can use those three as somewhat of a, a catalyst of understanding for us to say, okay, so how are they answering this and what do they do with these 27 versions? Which one is, is right? Yeah, um, I, I made up a little, uh, a little cartoon about this um, and I called it uh, Quran Chef. Um, can you see that on your screen? Yes, we can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, the the problem was that uh, they said, well, there's only one true Quran, um, but in fact, we've got these uh, 27 versions around. By the way, these are available. You can buy these. I lived in Jordan for a couple of years. There's a bookshop there. You could just go down and buy these. Um, you can order them online. Um, so uh, there's a group called Easy Quran. Um, uh, in Lebanon and the one in Jordan is called where did I get that from uh, Dar el Fikr um, you can buy these versions there so it's it's not as though you know they're hidden away in a library they're public available you can uh, um, you know you could um, send uh, go online find the site and you'll have it within two weeks um, and that's where I got uh, a lot of mine from. Others I got from traveling around. But then the question was, so which version are we going to have? So I called it, you know, the, the Quran chef with Dr. Yasser Qadi Shabir Ali and uh, uh, Adnan Rashid. And um, um, Shabir Ali says, well, I'm, I'm going to stick with the Hafs. That was the one that was the, the good one. That's acceptable. It's no different in terms of the content from the other ones. We see some variations and uh, that that's OK. We'll, we'll do that. Um, uh, Yasser Qadi and this incredible interview that he gave, I don't know if people have seen that. I've got a, a short clip of it here. I don't know if it's worth, you might not be able to see it if I play it. But he says, well, um, question by uh, Muhammad Hijab, well, which one is the, is the real one? And he said, well, it's not as simple as just choosing one. And he said, we'll have to uh, go for a mixture. We'll take bits from one and bits from the other. It will be the real Quran. But in effect, it's like nothing that exists on earth at the moment. It's like it would be his version, uh, his version of that. Um, <laughs> he's going to pull bits there. And I, and I call his, uh, his one the, um, the fruit salad Quran. <laughs> um, he's, he's taken a bit out of uh, Hafs and a bit out of the Warsh and a bit out of Duri and Susi and whatever, and he's put them together. Um, it's got all the bits from, from those, but it's not quite the same as what we have at the moment. Um, uh, Adnan Rashid, he was very upset uh, with Yasser Karim. He said he should never have gone on, he should never have talked about this thing. It's not something that's, that, needs, that can be talked about except by scholars. Um, and, he's, and they said, so what, what version would you go for? And he said, well, I'm going back to the, the basics. And so this was the one, and I mentioned before, the, the text which has got no dots in it. This would be one of the early manuscripts. Um, but no Arab can read this um if you if you ask them to read this they'll say well i don't know if that is a fa or a ka or a ba or a ya or a ta um you know that word could be something if they've memorized the text and you get them started often they'll be able to read it from the version that they've memorized so if they've memorized the Hus version they'll recite the Hus version if they've memorized the warish version they'll recite the warish version I was in Sudan a couple of years ago, and there the um, Aduri version is famous, and people would recite that. So you would have the same problem as they had back in Armenia, you know, in 650 AD, where the people would be reading the same text but reciting something differently. 
Um, so I said this was Adnan Rashid's uh, winning recipe. He just took the, the peels and the cores and um, he's, uh, yeah, gone down to the very basics, the basics one. Um, so this is the way that these three uh, respond to it. So Adnan Rashid says, you know, well, you can pick, you know, I'll go for the husk, but really you could pick any of them because it's all the word of God and it hasn't been, um, there's no uh, doctrinal differences between them. Yasser Qadi said, we'll take bits from here and there, but how he would choose that, he's gone offline now, he doesn't uh, do social media anymore because of that. And then um, Adnan Rashid pulling them back to the, um, uh, just to the, the text without dots. So that'd be the way those three deal with it. Wow, you know, it is, it is so good to see that. And, you know, when I was coming out of atheism, I remember uh, before I had converted, before I came to Christ, I remember watching, you know, the top guys and I always would appeal to authority. And, and so for me, I was an atheist. So I would appeal to, you know, the Dawkins and the so forth. And then I actually watched a video called Expelled No Intelligence Power. And I realized, wait a second, all, my, all the guys I would appeal to don't have an answer. So I think it should be very telling to a Muslim neighbor that the top apologists, the top scholars on this don't have an answer for the true transmission that lines up with what the Quran teaches concerning its nature and concerning what you've been taught all these years. So it's really, really important. And I, I think this is something really good to get into because, guys, when the top apologists are coming up with this, and as you see, I know we make a light of it because the answers that they're giving just don't add up to truth. And in fact, that's somewhat what Dr. Sheikh Yasser Qadi was saying in that interview, that there's a certain red line that you go to with reverence for the Quran where you stop asking questions. But in the West, they will use your own material against you to show how faulty the narrative is that you've been given. And I guess this would be a great time to transition a little bit because a lot of this information comes right out of the Hadith. And I, you know what? I, I believe you wrote your doctrinal dissertation. Is that is that correct? That's right, that? yeah. Maybe maybe our listeners don't even know what the hadith is. You maybe you, you haven't heard of it. Maybe you know when we talked about it on the show, you were wondering what on earth we're talking about. So maybe if we can have an expert on the hadith specifically, uh, talk about what is the hadith, and I mean, really, what do you find in there? Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I'll uh, just pull out a. Um the hadith came out of the, the um, problem that when Muhammad uh, died, people became more and more interested in, um, you know, in his life, and particularly as Islam began to expand. And we can see here that the um, uh, uh, Islam pushed out very quickly from the Arabian Peninsula, and it began invading countries. And so people wanted to know the stories of Muhammad, what was he like, what did he say. But when you get to a place like, say, Kabul or um, over to Spain, people, uh, and again, this was maybe a 100 years later, um, people had no idea about Muhammad. And so they started collecting stories about Muhammad and um, putting them into um, uh, in, uh, in, into text that they could trans, uh, send around. So here's some of the earliest um, collections. So notice the the important one is this uh, one in the centre there, I call it years after Muhammad's death. N none of them were collected within the lifetime of Muhammad. So these weren't eyewitnesses. These were stories that were put together a century or a century and a half after Muhammad died. Um, and so th they uh, were then trans um, put into books and these stories started to go around. Um, some of them were um, had official um, uh, support. For example, this one here by um, a Shabab, Ibn Shabab al-Zuhri was requested by the Caliph. Um, uh, this was a different Ummah, not the first Ummah, Ummah the second. Um, a, a hundred years or so after Muhammad died. Um, and the early um, hadith had no... Um, so when a person recited a hadith, they would say, well, um, I heard this from, and down there, Humaydi, who heard it from Sufyan, who heard it from Yahya, who heard it from Muhammad, who heard it from al Qama, who heard it from Umar, who heard it from Muhammad. Again, there were no written records. So these were all by oral transmission. 
and um, the early hadith, you just uh, someone would just say, well, I heard Muhammad once said such and such, um, and you didn't really know how it how it uh, came into being, and so a lot of people would just make up hadiths. Um, they would say, um, oh yeah, um, I want to do something, and I heard one time Muhammad did the same thing. Um, and there was this story of one man, uh, Abdul Karim Abu al uja who confessed to fabricating 4,000 hadiths. He just was making up stories about Muhammad said they caught him out and he was um, executed uh, because of that. And so they came to, skip out of that one, they came to what we now call the golden age of hadiths. Um, and this was the period after. Um, um, uh, it's about um, 200 years after Muhammad died. So in that first 100 years, there were no Hadith collections. Nobody had any written records of what Muhammad did. In the second 100 years, there were only 30 collections, but none of these had their trains, what they call the Isnad or the train of transmission, which tells you who they got it from. And it was in the third 100 years from 830 to 930 AD, we get the 50 uh, hadith collections and this is called the golden age and these guys were a little bit more um, careful about their sources and so they said anytime we hear a story about muhammad we need to know how it came to us how it was transmitted to us um, again they couldn't go back and look in a book it had to be verbal transmission i say the equivalent is like in australia it was about um 200 years ago we had white settlement here uh, captain cook uh, came and captain philip came later on to establish a, a, a first colony from britain um and i said imagine if i told you to go and find out the stories of that but you're not allowed to use any written records you have to go and ask somebody who knew 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 captain cook um, that's basically what happened with these hadith. Um, and so you get the, the collections, over 50 collections. They had higher standards. It was, um, if there was a written record, they wouldn't accept it. It said it had to be verbal. And then they classified some hadith as uh, authentic or sahir, um, good as hasan, weak as laif or fabricated mawdu'a. And you can see there, El Bukhari, he had 600,000 different stories about Muhammad and he accepted a half of 1% of them as authentic. Um, and there's multiple copies of some of them to make it up to 7,000 in his collection. He's seen as the uh, the gold standard of um, uh, of the Hadith, the, um, uh, the, the kind of the Rolls Royce standard. And these would be the, the, six, main cop the six main collections that are accepted now. So there's El Bukhari up the top, then Muslim a little bit below him, and then these four other ones are Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, uh, uh, and Nasai, and Abu Dawood. I did my doctorate on El Bukhari, so uh, going through and doing an analysis of it and um, uh, just checking up uh, what the contents were and particularly how we can use that in ways for sharing the gospel. So that's the Hadith at the moment. But there's over a hundred different copies of the, uh, or different versions, uh, different collections of the Hadith, um, but these would be the six ones that people would typically refer to as acceptable. Wow, you know, I, I think that's great because one of the things I, I, I love sharing on the streets and I would have all these different hadiths and then eventually I started to realize the one that no matter what, if I brought it up, it was Sahih al-Bukhari. When I would bring that one up specifically, they, they wouldn't say, oh, I don't, I don't trust that one. I don't trust that one. That was just handwritten, I think, as somebody once said to me uh, about using some. So I said, Okay, that, that's interesting. So I've been kind of using that one, and it's interesting. I guess maybe I could transition um, in, in, your, in my questioning for you on this because I love street evangelism. That is my passion. I met my, got to know my wife that way and then asked her to marry me. And in fact, most of the people that I was sharing with when I was a newer convert out on the street sharing the gospel were Muslims down in Santa Monica. And that's, they had a booth and everything, and I would talk with them. And they were the ones that would bring a lot of the challenges where a lot of other people didn't really want to talk to me. And so I, I kind of got, I get, guess my feet wet in evangelism with sharing the gospel with Muslims. And so you are not only a, a scholar, which you are a scholar indeed, but you were a missionary for over 20 years. I believe you're an evangelist as well. 
So I, I guess not only using Sahih al-Bukhari or, or the Quran or, you know, obviously the word of God, the deutimous power of the gospel, how, give us some ways that you share the gospel with Muslims, especially on the streets specifically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my first approach, so yeah, we, we have a street outreach every Saturday where a group of us go out and um, share the gospel. We've set up a, uh, a couple of tables. I'll see if I can just pull up a, um, a picture to show you what we're doing. You see, we've got a table out there um, and down the bottom there says, Jesus loves Muslims, so do we. And then at the top, we are Christians sharing Jesus and engaging with Islam. And uh, on the table, you can see a whole lot of different uh, pamphlets that we have. So I wrote these for the team. So raising, uh, answering the different questions that people um, raise. So, you know, why do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Um, also responding to issues about Islam. So they'll say, well, Muhammad was the perfect man. And they've got, there's an Islamic table about uh, five metres away to uh, on the right-hand side of this one. Uh, on the other side of the intersection, maybe 20 meters away. And they have, you know, Muhammad, the perfect man and the Quran. Um, so we've written uh, brochures to them. They're all available on my website, by the way, berniepower.com. You can go on there and uh, download those. Um, and uh, when Muslims come and talk to us, my first approach is to find out, well, what kind of Muslim is this? You know, wh- where, what are the issues that they're facing? Sometimes we'll get Iranians, you know, who will say, oh, yeah, well, look, I'm a Muslim, but I don't actually believe a lot of that stuff. And then you go down one path and others will take, uh, you know, a, a very strong stance. Yeah, Muhammad is the, the best person who's ever lived. The Quran is the only perfect book. Um, and so I'll then respond to their their particular issues. Um, but usually when I'm talking with them, I'll, I'll want to try and get to a place where I can uh, talk and I'll, I'll talk about the Trinity early on uh, because that's a key point of difference between what they believe and what we believe. And so, you know, you believe in a simple understanding of the nature of Allah, um, that is um, uh, a, a, an indivisible unity. And I say, but we believe in a complex understanding of God, that God is three in one, and then go on to talk about um, Jesus from, from that kind of basis. So it depends a little bit on the person and where they're at and uh, and how we would go in into that Um if they're um, committed to the Quran, then I'll use the Quran as the starting point um, to talk about Jesus and then move to the Bible as the, the ultimate point and um, get to sharing the gospel with them. So those would be some of the things that I would do. Yeah, I think that's so wonderful. And one of the great things that, and one of the reasons I wanted to have Dr. Bernie Power on specifically is because it's great to, to be a scholar and be able to teach so many students who hopefully will go out and share, but then you getting out and doing the dirty work yourself, right? And and I think that's so important, brother, because I, I think more people need to be that way, that we say, hey, you know, we do love them. And, you know, we interviewed Dr. Gordon Nickel as, as well. And he had the same heart, you know, and one of the things that I find uh, to be very interesting is those like yourself, like the Gordon Nichols of the world as well, it, it seems as though those who, uh, ex- their expertise is sharing specifically to Muslims, it, it just seems like there is such a love for them that they want them so badly to know the gospel. And, and is that the case for you as well? Yeah. And, you know, when people say, well, how should we approach Muslims? I'd say you need to approach each person as an individual. This is somebody who's made in the image of God, somebody who is loved by God. Uh, They've got a a, a personal story, a personal history. There's pains, uh, hurts in their lives. And so we need to tap into those and to show them how Jesus is the one who can can go in and answer all of those needs and um, and of course their ultimate need of salvation. Um, yeah, and in fact, I'm giving a talk tonight uh, here talking about um, um, the the future of Islam, where it's going to go. And I'll I'll share with telling stories of contacts that I've had with Muslims, and I'll actually tell them I, I had an operation two weeks ago. I, my face, I've got a little bit of a scar on there. Um, just a little thing there that was done by a by a Muslim surgeon. So um, they said to me, "You need to choose a surgeon," and so I chose a guy um, who's a Muslim fellow. Um, you know, we buy our our meat from a uh, a Muslim butcher whose name's Jihad. We live in a, a kind of a, a strongly Muslim area part of Melbourne, um, so we have contact with Muslims. And I think it's important that we, you know, 
deal with them in loving ways. So, um, yeah, that, that would be, I think that's the heart of God, really, that gives us that uh, um, privilege and opportunity and love to be able to share with them. I, I absolutely love that, Dr. Power, because I, I think that should be our hearts, like it, like you said. And, you know, one of the things uh, I find interesting is I, I, I've read that also you deal with kind of a storytelling approach when it comes to sharing the gospel with Muslims. Maybe give us a little insight on, on why you use that kind of approach. Mm, yeah, okay. So when we were working overseas, we lived in countries, uh, for example, Oman and Yemen, where the level of literacy was really quite low. And it was no good giving a person uh, um, a, a New Testament or a Bible in Arabic because they couldn't read it. Um, and also, most of them had never been to school. Um, so in um, my generation, uh, in, in a lot of these countries, the guys had never been to school. They'd grown up uh, working on the land or maybe working in the city. Um, there weren't any schools, and so they never went, they ne never learned how to read. So that affects the ways that people think about things. So often uh, they don't think in terms of um, concepts or abstract ideas, um, but they're very much more concrete in their thinking. And so I developed a whole st series of stories that explain uh, different aspects of the um, of the gospel with them. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll tell you one that, um, yeah, we've got a few minutes, um, uh, that I would use when people would say, well, look, you know, Islam and Christianity are basically the same. And I said, well, let me tell you the story of a man named Ahmed. One day he's walking out in the desert. It's not, it was actually nighttime walking in the desert um, because there's a lot of desert in, in that part of the world. And um, he fell down a big hole. There was a sinkhole and he fell into it. And the more he tried to get out, the worse his situation got. And he soon realized he would never escape by himself. He would need help. So he calls out, help, somebody up there, please help me. And soon a face appears at the top. And the face looks down and says, Ahmed, you're in big trouble. I would love to come down and help you, but I'm alone. I can't come down. But what I'll do is I'll send you down a book and you can read this book and you can try and work out how to save yourself. So he drops a book down to Ahmed. At the same time, there's another man walking in the desert. His name's Mabruk. And he also falls down a hole, another hole, a lot of holes in this desert. And same thing happens. The more he tries to escape, the worse his situation gets. And so he says, I'm going to need some outside help. So he calls, help, somebody up there, please help me. And soon three faces appear at the top. And they look down and they say, well, um, Mabruk, we would love to do whatever we can to help you. Um, what we need is someone who can go down into the hole. And of the, there were three, and one of them was very strong and he could hold anything. Second one was very brave, he would go anywhere. And the third one was very gentle, he would help anyone. And so the... The brave one says, well, I'm willing to go down to the hole if someone will hold the rope. And the gentle one, sorry, the strong one and the gentle one said, well, we will hold the rope. And they lower him down into the hole and he gets down there and he takes the sand off around from Mabruk and ties the rope around his waist. And then they begin to pull him out of the hole. And he gets nearly to the top when his foot hits the side of the sand and all the sand collapses on top of the brave one and buries him and he dies. Well, the strong one and the gentle one said, even though our companion is dead, we will not abandon him to the grave. So they dig and they dig and they dig. For three days they dig and eventually they get down to him and he's dead. And the gentle one says, but I can breathe, in, breathe into him and by the power of God, he'll come back to life again. And he does. He leans over and, <laughs> and praise God, the brave one who was dead comes back to life again. And there's great rejoicing, uh, not only because the brave ones come back to life, but also because Mabruk, who had been lost, was saved. And so I'd say to my Muslim friends, so who would you prefer to be in that story? Ahmed, who is still in the hole reading the book, trying to save himself, or Mabruk, who had been saved by the three who came to his rescue and the brave one who came and died uh, in, in the process of rescuing him? And when I tell them this story, I remember one time I told it to a group in Yemen, they get, oh, you're very clever because we know what you believe. I said, yeah, we believe in a God who is three in one. God, the Father, who is God with us. God, the Son, who is 
God, uh, sorry, God the Father who is God for us, God the Son who is God with us, who comes down to be part of us, and God the Holy Spirit who gives life. And I said, that's the difference between the two. It's really about what's going to happen to you and how you're going to be saved. So that was a, a story. So I put in that, you know, the, uh, the concept of the Trinity, the differentiation between Islam and Christianity, uh, the idea of the death um, uh, and the resurrection um, and salvation are, are all in that story. I absolutely love that. And I love your approach as well, using stories. You know, there was a carpenter that did that as well back in the day, you know, the parables and so forth. Uh, he was my but, inspiration. <laughs> that's, good. that's a good inspiration to have. So, you know, that, that, is, that is so awesome. And, you know, when I think about the, this idea of, sh of sharing stories and showing them over and over again the love of God, that was one thing when I had just, you know, with with a group of, of young men, we had gone through the Quran and we had talked a lot about that. And I said, does it not just give you just such a greater love for how good our God is? I mean, when you study and, and see it, you know, see Christ juxtaposed with Muhammad and see the father just that we have in the scriptures that we read about juxtaposed with, you know, um, the Allah in, in the Quran. I, I said, studying this, if it did anything for me, was remind me how much my father loves me to send me his only son. And, and it really stuck out to me. And it made me have such more compassion on the Muslim who is being deceived by a deceiver. And it does break my heart. And I want them to come to the Lord. I want them to come and, and plead for them to come to know Christ. And as we're supposed to be reconcilers, that's exactly what we want to be. As believers in Christ, and so it's so good to hear these stories, Doctor Power, and I'm I'm beyond blessed by them. I, I think it's great, and I hope more people maybe can check out some more materials. Is there anything right now that you may be working on, or something that you have out there in the ether that you'd love for people to connect with you and in, in some way and get involved, or also just learn from you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. So a lot, of, as I mentioned, a lot of the stuffs on my website. So BerniePower.com. You can you can access the material there. Um, yeah. So I'm working. So this the book of stories is uh, hopefully going to be published um, by the end of this year. I've written about uh, 20 different ones that I've developed over the years in sharing with Muslims for different specific uh, uh, situations that people raise. You know, has the Bible be ch been changed? Why would Jesus die for us? Um, how important is sin, all those kinds of issues. No, I love it. And you know what? Uh, when you come out with that, I'm probably going to have to bother you again and bring you back on the show to to go through that. I, I would absolutely love that. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Bernie Power, so much for coming on the Good Fight Radio Show. And for you guys, once again, he already told you his website, BerniePower.com. And also go on YouTube as well. There are a number of resources, number of videos. You've been on Jay Smith's channel there's other channels you've been on, Apologetics channels, and also your own. So, guys, go check him out and be blessed. And, guys, hopefully if this does anything, I, I hope that this show would give you the impetus, that would give you just a burning passion to want to share the gospel with our Muslim neighbors. God bless you guys, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Power. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks for having me.